Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey guys, Todd Helms here with another episode of the Wingman Podcast, and I have Corey Loeffler on with me today from, well, a lot of different things, but DRC Calls, um... Man, Loeffler Customs, you, we were talking beforehand, you had a chance to do the um, unveiling of the whites, the Nodak system with Sitka, and dude, I really appreciate your time and you jumping on with me today. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Uh, should be a blast. Let's, uh, let's dive into it. What should we get into first? Well, how was your season? I mean, I know <laughs> you're, you're grinding all the time up there in Minnesota, so... What did it look like back there? It was man, it's been it's been really spotty out here in in the west. Okay, um, yeah, I had a very unconventional season. Probably I grabbed a couple uh, early. I met up with Matt McCormick, Brady Davis from Montana, um, Austin Lemieux. We met up out in North Dakota in August and and beat around out there for a while kind of got our butts kicked but we were able to put some august geese on the ground so that was fun kicked off the season out there and then minnesota opened up with our september season so we got after uh, we got after those september birds i did a little bit of bow hunting before our season started uh chasing some uh, some velvet mule deer out with simon carlson out in south dakota so we had some fun doing that um i was just all over the place with a bunch of different trips and a bunch of different product projects. So I really didn't hunt too much around my, my house here and kind of around my home turf. Um, one really cool project that we got into and haven't really, we haven't really, uh, talked about it or released too many of the photos from it, but, um, uh, Simon Carlson and JJ Gustafson with lifetime decoys, we went on a, a very backwoods duck hunt for a few days and uh, we loaded up the boat. We actually had the boss, boss shot shells, uh, mud motor boat uh, from County line boats. We had that out on the river and we took it way up the river. We built a camp on the river bank and we stayed there and camped out in a little fort that we built for three nights and hunted for four days up in the absolute middle of nowhere and uh, <laughs> totally completely off grid um it was it was cooler than heck it was very primitive it, we all had to pack super light and of course jj was with so we brought way too many decoys and we couldn't bring anything else because we had to bring all those decoys so I, it was just struggle after struggle and uh we had no power tools so we I chopped everything down with this ax that I bought and sharpened the absolute piss out of it before I left. So the thing was just mint, but <laughs> chopped a whole bunch of dead trees down, notched them all. So they fit in with each other and then made a log cabin that all intertwined with all the wood. And then we chinked the outside of it with a bunch of river mud and all this tall grass that we found and packed it in there. Cause we had some wild Northwest winds come rolling in on us. And it was super nice when we were loading the boat up, that was no problem. And then, uh, yeah, like day two that fork, it was forecasted for not good weather. So we had to totally tear our whole camp down cause they built it way too tall. And then we, ripped it down to nothing and then we had to rebuild it so it was really small and real short so we had to crawl in and crawl out because we had to double layer the tarps on top of us so um but it was just wild you know cooking every meal in the dutch oven over the campfire that was our only source of heat and, and food and um man it it was just it was just awesome every every bit of it we can't wait to get back out there next year add to our little two wall cabin hopefully make it a four wall cabin for next year and just keep that story going so that was that was a big one and that was super early that was uh late september when we did that trip and so yeah then uh after that it was you know, kind of full on honker hunting and uh borders were closed of course for canada so didn't run up there just kind of hung around home did a lot of deer hunting chased a lot of whitetails in the rut over in south dakota and um so that was that was season yeah and then more trips with uh, sitka after that and filming this white uh filming the the release video for the whites out in north dakota um chasing some snow geese out there with with buddies matt mccormick brady davis 
uh, Zach Herfindahl was out there. And um, gosh, after that, it was whitetail rut. And then it was another freelance honkers trip out to Montana with Matt McCormick, Brady Davis again. Simon Carlson was out there. And a couple of the guys that won the contest for the freelance honkers hunt. Um, and then it was from there, grabbed the whites out there from Matt. And we had, ah, I don't know how many, a dozen pairs or so, something like that. We had all the rest of the available pairs and um, took the whites on a road trip. Uh, Brett Amundsen, a good buddy of mine with Minnesota uh, with Sporting Journal Radio, he jumped in and we just went on a big road trip and delivered whites to a whole bunch of guys, um, just a whole bunch of guides, outfitters, grinders along the way. Minnesota, well, we started in Minnesota. Um, it was two stops in Kansas and Oklahoma and a couple stops in Texas and then another stop back up in Kansas and then home and uh, like a two week road trip there. So it was, it was a wild one. Yeah. So you, after I'm guessing after the first of the year, you probably slept for about a week. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, first of the year. Um, this was the, I, so I just got back from the whites trip on, I don't even know what day it is, but. Um, so I've been gone for like about three weeks or so, and I just got back here four or five days ago. So yeah, all the, the freelance honkers and then the release of the whites, that's all been after the new year. So, um, I, I wish I could sleep for four or five days, but I get back to the call shop and I'm up to my eyeballs in orders that need to get out the door now. Good. Just grinding. (laughs) Good for you, man. Wow. You, you make the rest of us look like we're sitting still. I tell you what. (laughs) Good for you. Dude, when you were telling that that log cabin duck hunt story, that I'm I mean I think my face cramped up. I was smiling so hard. That was awesome. That I mean, where did you get the idea for that? Because that's uh, I mean that's old I, that's old school stuff. That's really cool. Well, should I tell you honestly? Can you keep a secret? Uh, oh, of was... course, but I don't know how many <laughs> listeners can. <laughs> it was it was it, I just from watching the Netflix, it's a show on Netflix, but alone, the yep. reality show yep. alone. Yep. Um, I just was watching that and I saw the architecture, the design ideas of the cabins that these people built by themselves while filming it themselves. And I, I mean, I was kind of amazed at some of the architecture on that show. And I was a little bit disappointed and kind of disgusted at some of the decisions they make and you're yelling at the tv half the time i at least i was when i was watching my wife, it, so i said yeah what's... my wife doesn't let me watch it anymore because i yell too much <laughs> what the hell are you doing <laughs> <laughs> oh, idiot <laughs> you're going home <laughs> no million dollars for you right exactly <laughs> Oh, no kidding. No uh, kidding. So we did that. I, I pitched the idea to those guys, and JJ said, I'm in. Uh, I'm going to get a plane ticket booked right now. Let's go. I'm freaking ready. So we just piled in the boat, and we did it, and we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. Simon Carlson, uh, for, photographer, videographer, buddy of mine, he was along for the ride, and he had no idea what he was going to capture in front of his camera, but he was just there to, to grab whatever came his way. And, uh, some of the Im- images were, um, were, yeah, they were, they, they image tells a thousand oh, yeah. words. So, oh, yeah. uh, yeah, it, you could see the, the amount of exhaust, uh, the just, we were just beaten down and exhausted after that, you know, I bet. So it was so much walking and, so much mud it's all um i don't know if i can say this but it's all loon shit up there so wow. you're just sinking oh you're sinking up to your knees and your waist uh, duck hunting and all that stuff so yeah um, i re- as we hunted stuff like that growing up and it was like there's no bottom to it you know you'd, right. you stand on one bank and jump up and down in the trees <laughs> and, and on the other bank are yeah they're waving around you know that's it it's like oof yeah. but I remember, I remember that stuff, but did you kill any ducks? I mean, was it okay? Oh yeah. We ate everything that we killed. I oh, mean, I bet. It was, yeah. It was all, uh, we, the only bummer to it was it was early in the season. So the ducks were hard to pluck and then they didn't have much fat on them really yep. at all. And that's really what we were after. And we just wanted, you know, meat and fat. That's what we, we had to have that to survive. So, um, uh, the, they were, yeah, they were great. We made, um we made a pasta 
spaghetti the one night, and I can't remember which night that was, but I uh, pat myself on the back for that one because I added. We didn't have a strainer, obviously. We had a right. Dutch oven. That was it. And we had noodles. So I had to make the sauce and the water and the pasta all with the right amount of water because I couldn't drain any of the water out of there. So I right. eyeballed it. JJ and I discussed. We kind of went back and forth on how much water this pasta was going to soak up. And we'd go through and boil it. And it it turned out like just perfect. I couldn't believe that we did that <laughs> on, a, on a campfire with a Dutch oven. We had spaghetti what the heck was in it i don't know spaghetti and diced duck i suppose yeah exactly you know, whatever spaghetti and duck balls in there so jeez <laughs> yeah that's i mean that's getting into like minus the ducks in the boat that's getting into like wyoming territory where we take stock into the mountains to hunt you know yeah you're gone right for on. weeks at a time you know yep. you don't build cabins or anything but you got you know little portable shelters and TVs yeah. or whatever but right that right. is cool man that that is an adventure that you will never ever forget that right for sure it's documented pretty well so cool hopefully that stuff will surface sometime soon i hope so, so too i would uh, i'm now you got me and you got everybody's <laughs> everybody interested in it now and they're going to be looking for it no that is dude that is cool but yeah thanks yeah so yeah i mean Kind of the same deal, running around and and chasing birds like like a lot of guys are doing. But, um, you you have the DRC call company. Yep, that's correct? my full time full time job. You I've do been that full time. Yeah, I've been making calls for since about two thousand seven. Okay, so it's yeah, it's uh, we're kind of creeping up on fifteen years now, and uh, um, we have a full line of goose calls, short read goose calls anything from real beginner stuff, real beginner honker stuff to um, our lesser call or a little goose call is like by far the most popular of anywhere. All the guys down South, whether it's, um, you know, earlier in the season, if it's North Dakota, Colorado, South Dakota guys chasing those little birds uh, and then on to kansas oklahoma texas i mean all the guides all the outfitters down there are seem to be blowing that little short drop goose call that we got but just this little guy super yep. short um real high pitch thing and it's just crazy easy to blow so you can get so many notes out of it with one breath and uh one one blast of air one breath and that's really what those little geese love is just the more noise you can make the better um so that thing has just i've had it on market for you know, uh, whatever, about 12 years now, 13 years probably. But within these last couple, I can say it's absolutely just blown up and taken off like crazy. So um, shipping those things as fast as I can make them now, guys really seem to love them. And then we have some honker calls too that kind of more appeal to the guys up here in the northern part and, and upper Midwest uh, chasing those big geese around. Uh, our season has come and gone now for ev most everyone chasing the real big geese. But uh, we make a, a full line of calls for those as well. And then we got that new Sandhill Crane call out that's pretty cool that. as well. So, I yeah. saw that. <laughs> I don't yeah, even literally out of completely out of stock um, right now. I have none. So I'm trying to make them you. as fast as I can. So Yeah, that, it's that's... crazy how the little, ge the little goose game and the, the crane game in the last couple of years has just blown up. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. blown up. You know, Absolutely. I used to hate in in the in the you know on the upper great lakes i used to hate seeing those big groups of little geese we <laughs> always it seemed like they were you always killed some you know there's always mm -hmm. cacklers around or we just call them cacklers yeah yep. and Most and there were they were mixed in they were always mixed in with big groups of migrators you know and it was no big deal yeah and in and in singles or pairs or threes or small they're dumb they come yeah. pitching right in and oh yeah but dude there was one fall i remember we had a flock Blow, blew in on a north wind and there must have been about 300 of them mm -hmm. and you couldn't decoy those things no. you couldn't you could not kill them right they'd come and they'd make a big spin over over whatever you were hunting and just keep right on and they'd go someplace else mm -hmm. and yeah. i'm like that's i didn't think anything of it at the time but knowing what i know now with those handful of experiences i've got holy smokes but yeah those guys down there that are that are killing those things full time Man, they get some crazy big spins and oh, yeah. just just smash those things. It's so cool. 
big spreads, run them wide, run them big, hide good, probably hide in the whites, in some white decoys. A lot of times if you're chasing those little birds, you'll have white birds around. So in, you can yeah. set your, you can set a, a smaller white spread off to the side of your little goose spread or your, your Canada spread. And um, yeah, just pack them in super tight and then maybe leave a little loose spot right out in front of you for them to, to focus in on. And a lot of times uh, guy, uh, hunters, guides, outfitters, whatever, ripping on calls so much and so loud that those little geese just focus right in on that area. And so you don't, uh, you don't really have to necessarily leave an open spot for them to land or you don't really have to worry about them landing outside of the spread or outside of the decoys like honkers tend to do so often just because those little geese are they're a victim to the the noise really uh, and yep. the more the more you can throw at them the more they like it so. yeah they're rude little things they'll land right on each other's heads you know oh gosh they those big, no it's a those fight big geese. yeah exactly yeah. it's a fight yeah it's like a they, fight for food yeah it's like little geese with big attitudes you know they just <laughs> They're funny, but yeah, I, we, like I said, we're out here with, it's kind of not a lot of, we don't get a lot of white geese in this, in this area mm -hmm. and the, uh, the geese, you know, we're still, I'm still looking at two weeks of late honker season here. Awesome. And no, no birds. <laughs> oh, shit. I mean, they're, oh, I'm, I'm watching the weather and Montana's getting pounded right now. So it's okay. like, okay, that's what you guys are waiting for. Yeah, we yep. need. As you know, the snow doesn't bother them too much as long as they mm -hmm. can get to food. Yeah. But I'm yeah. really hoping we're supposed to get it's supposed to get really cold here, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that'll that'll lock up their water and that'll yeah. that'll drive them out. That'll yeah. That'll drive and them out. If it gets really be... cold, we'll get a big push of birds for yeah. the last week, and because we haven't we haven't had hardly any goose hunting at all this fall, and we've wow. killed we've killed a few, but the guys that are really targeting them are like, man, these, the birds we have are so stale. They're so mm -hmm. beat up. Yeah. I've been, I've been watching the same, same group, probably three, 400 birds. And it's like, I'm waiting for them to do something that I can capitalize on. Yeah. You know, it's rough. Cause right now they're, they're scared of each other. They won't yeah. land. They'll make a big loop through the field, get the wind right. And then set down 50 or 60 or 70 yards away from any other geese. Gosh. From a distance, it looks like they're all landing in one part kind of together. Yeah. But then you go look at it from another angle, and they're all in little family groups. Mm -hmm. And they're all spread out. Jeez. They won't land anywhere near each other. They'll feed in to the same spot, walk mm -hmm. in, but they won't. It's crazy. Yeah. So I'm looking at it going, eh, I got to find like a, a loafing area where they're spending time during the middle of the day or something. But mm -hmm. it's just too nice. I mean, yep. good grief, it's like 45, almost 50 degrees in February. Yeah. When we were up in Montana just a few weeks ago, it was dang near T-shirt weather up there. And uh, a year prior, it was crazy cold. So yeah, I, I know your struggles. And we, we don't hardly, hardly have any snow around here in Minnesota. Okay. And we've been seeing some some 30 and 35 degree days and normally that's 35 below so yeah it's unseasonably warm yeah we hunted this same time last year we had jim sobeer from sitka come down yeah you bet. and we did a goose hunt with him and it was i mean single digits with a 30 20 mile an hour wind it was mm -hmm. brutal i mean it was 20 below easy easy that day and then the next day we hunted something hunted a river set up and it was just slush mm -hmm. just pushing slush and sure we we slammed them. I mean, we we crushed them, but it was that was what we need. Yeah, we don't have it. Get that. We don't have it at all. Get that but, weather. Yeah, I hear you. So this crane call, you don't have one to to hold up and show, but how? Uh, tell me about that sucker. Uh, it's three pieces. Um, this one, yeah. Let's see. So here's the mouthpiece and the insert right here. Okay. Okay. And it threads one. together. Yep, that threads together right there, and then there's there's an insert, a tube that goes on the end of that, and there's O rings on here. So, you, um, and the way it's the way I have it designed, it like locks into place at a couple different spots along the way. Oh, so cool! You can kind of hear it clicking you every can, once in a while. So that's going to so change your pitch. Yep, that'll change the pitch. So that's as close. Um, that's as short as the call gets right there. So that'll be a higher pitch, and then you can extend it. My favorite spot to blow it is 
right before that insert shows. So like right there, Got that's it. my favorite spot to to blow it. And I I don't know if this one's tuned, but we can find out. <laughs> not quite. Reads Close a little though. Bit that's not, that didn't it's, sound bad. I'll just pop the guts out real quick. Yeah, right there you go. go. Yeah, we used to while you're doing that. We used to we never could hunt cranes. Where, yep. I grew, where I grew up, but we'd mess with them with our calls, and we always blew those. Back in the old days, we had those. Everybody had a big river long honk of flute. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, you bet. and you could trill your tongue with that call yep. and make it yep. sound not exactly, obviously, but it was yep. close enough. Get them they, to respond. A oh little yeah, bit. they'd come. They'd be a, do a big spin over your goose decoys, you know. Yep. And right. we dreamed about the days when maybe we'd be able to hunt them someday. <laughs> yep. And maybe That's have cool. It tuned up. Might have it tuned up now for you. I'll give you a little. Yeah, do it. There you go. Yeah, buddy. Now I want to go. Over now there. I want to go to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. There we hopefully go. Got... back in. Hopefully back in stock. Mm, in a week. Soon. Cool. That is very cool. Yeah, I would imagine guys are just running you, running you ragged on that. They want them, uh, maybe not as much now. Season should be winding down, and those guys should be uh, they should be able to pump the brakes until hopefully the border opens up and the guys run up to Saskatchewan, Manitoba next year. Um, but yeah, no, oh, that is cool. How did you get started building calls? I, uh, you know, I was blown in contests a lot when I was in high school and just out of high school um, and doing fairly well with that. And I just got this bug that I needed to extend the waterfall season all year long. And, and contest calling kind of did scratch that itch for me a little bit. And then it got a little bit more serious than that. And I knew that I wanted to have a job in the outdoor industry some way, shape, or form. And I really couldn't find a contest call on the market at that time. Like this is 2000, oh man, 2000, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, that whole time. I couldn't find a call on the market that really fit my needs and what I was looking for in a call. There wasn't a ton of them to choose from. And so I set out to try and make one. Um, you know, I wanted to make my own contest call that was going to fit my needs and, and was catered to the way I blew a call and, and uh, would hopefully help me win some contests. So one thing that I designed at the, this life sentence is uh in a pretty easy blowing, easy learning honker call that I make. And that was the flagship model right there, our, our very first one. But one thing that I wanted was a finger groove on the insert right here because my hand was always sliding around when I get sweaty and I'd really get into the middle of my contest routine. Um, and uh, so I wanted a finger groove on there that I didn't, I, you know, I put hockey tape and I put rubber bands on here and stuff like that. And that helped too. But uh, I just wanted that call. I wanted it built right into the acrylic so that you would have a spot to put your finger and that was going to help contest callers. And that was going to help any beginner with hand placement and would give them a spot to put their, their very first finger. And then the rest of your hand, the rest of your fingers or hand placement would kind of fall into place after that, after you had that one finger on there. So, um, that finger groove was super important to me. And then an oversized radius on the mouthpiece. I didn't want any sharp edges here on the mouthpiece. There was a lot of calls on the market with some really sharp spots on them. Um, and it's, it kind of has, a, has a, a relation to how you machine the calls and how, um, how the, the CNC machines and the lathes make the calls and, and cut them off and stuff like that. That's why there's some sharp edges on this end of, the, of some, some other call makers mouthpieces and just didn't fit my style. I didn't like it. Um, I, 
you know, lips would hurt and get super yeah. chapped and stuff like that from blowing those calls and practicing for many hours at a time. So that was pretty much why I started. And then it really took off from there. Um, I didn't go to school or college to be in the outdoor industry. I went to uh, business college for sales and marketing. So it all related right to selling goose calls. And uh, there's, there's really nothing that'll teach you how to start a business making duck and goose calls. That's for sure. Uh, no classes that you can take at the college. So it's right. just so much trial and error. And um, it, it was a lot of fun, you know, just adventurous. And I completely dove into it head first, dumped my whole life savings into starting the call company. And I was super nervous about it, but uh, I was young. So I said, I got to do it now. While I don't have, you know, I don't have a uh, mortgage and I don't have kids and cars and all that stuff to pay for. Um, I better do it right now and see if this thing works out. And if it doesn't, I can continue on selling insurance with my parents. And uh, if it does, we'll just keep going year after year and whatever until I got to get a job somewhere else. But haven't done that in whatever, 14 years now. There so you go. We're still going. It's working out. It's yeah. working out. No, that is, that's cool. Good for you. Yeah. yeah thanks. You talk about that sharp edge on the back, on that mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. I had a call long time ago there you and go. that literally like wore a groove in my lip. Right. It, I mean, it got to the point where I didn't want to blow. I didn't want to blow a goose call because yep. it hurt. Yep. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So I, I see, I see guys that are, you know, you're putting finger grooves on the front end of the mouth on the, on the mm -hmm. tone board. Yep. And on, and then they're rounding off mouthpieces and making them bigger and easier to use. Calls have come a long way. I mean, there's, and there were, I mean, hats off to the innovators, you know, that were, that started, started the game back in the old days. Mm -hmm. But man, it's like anything. Those innovators created a niche, created a, created a slot. And the younger, then it, it's like, okay, this is great. And then the next generation comes along and puts their stamp on things. And pretty soon you've got, you know, you've got calls, you got call companies like yours that are, I mean, they, those calls don't even look the same as they did, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Right. I just look at calls today and I'm like, wow, that is cool. It's just, a, <laughs> it's amazing how things have developed. You're looking for something here. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bunch of new acrylic stuff that's so coming cool out there so this is oh, all how does that new. how does that work i mean you obviously get a molded blank yeah let me grab a uh, let me grab a rod for you you bet uh, so most most of the acrylic that you're going to run across um comes in uh four foot long rod so there it is it's solid four feet long. Um, yep. This happens to be inch and a quarter diameter. So this is what I'm going to make the mouthpieces of my calls out of. So I got can it. turn those calls out of there. But um, yeah, you just take that acrylic and you might cut off pieces um, to put in your lathe or like in my case, I can put the whole thing in the lathe, spin that, you chuck onto it, you spin that. Um, I program the lathe to turn the outside of the call, drill the hole through the call, bore the call. And then, um, that's, that's pretty much it and, and, and cut it off. So the computer program does all of that stuff for you. So you got, wow. uh, on a, on a CNC lathe, you have to computer, right. Computer program, all that stuff on there. So, um, but yeah, you'd come through and drill it and bore it here and back bore it. And then you come through with a turn tool, turn all that stuff. And then, uh, the bands are another, another part too. Um, they add a lot of strength to where the call fits together. They yep. it gets really thin in that area. So, right. um, so yeah, that's, that's that. And then you do basically the same thing to the insert and a duck call is a little bit different. Uh, a duck call, you'll turn, the, you'll turn the outside of the duck call and drill it here and uh that drill bit runs all the way down into the tone channel here um but then once you get that part turned on a lathe then you have to put it in the mill and then the mill is gonna 
Cut that. There cuts you out go. Your tone, yep. Cuts out cut, your tone board and your tone that, channel. Cut that tone board for you. That's right, right there. Right. So, uh, the the duck call inserts are a two step process. They typically would take two machines, uh, a CNC lathe to do the turning work, and then a CNC mill to do the cutting work. Or you could do it with one really, really expensive machine that has a fourth axis or fifth axis or whatever and okay. live tools. But okay. that's probably getting up into the two hundred thousand dollar range. So he's uh, got to sell a lot of calls to pay that off. I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. No, that's that's interesting. You know, to to visit with somebody who actually can talk. The, talk you through the process and show how you show you, yeah, here you folks go. how that goes there's some That's really there's some, cool some inventory for you about oh yeah there. yeah you've been busy now do you have any employees or is it just you i have a, a fair amount of of guys that stop over um high school kids and college kids and, and guys that are kind of laid off in the winter time which is pretty common so uh and then my wife is the saving grace she's the aren't they all that, She's the glue that holds this circus together uh, day in and day out. So uh, she, I'm going like this, and she tries to keep me focused a little bit. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Yeah, so, pretty much, pretty yeah. much. But we do all of our, um, I'm looking at the, the shirt room over here. So she prints all the shirts here in-house. Right. So I do all the design work on the computer, um, like the logos for the calls, all the right. laser engraving. I do all that work on the computer. Um, then our decals, we cut our own decals and stickers. And then uh, I design logos for the shirts. And then she presses and prints the shirts over in the shirt room. So we pretty much do everything all in-house here from you know, basically everything that's on the website, we do it, um, pretty much all of it. That's cool. So, it, yeah. Because I, yeah, I was tooling around on there and I'm like, wow, you guys have lots of cool stuff, you know, lots of options Thanks. out there for people. And I wondered, I mean, are you outsourcing this? What are you doing? But yeah, mm -hmm. you're producing it all there. That's, you guys are busy, man. You are busy. Yeah. How do you find time to go build log cabins out of mud and sticks <laughs> in the wilderness is beyond me. Uh, I, have a, I have a great wife. That's yeah. for sure. She no, does. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, oh, that is that is cool. So what is the rest of the year? I mean, what does it look like coming up on spring for you guys? You got to be getting ready to go chase Whitey around a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm kind of waiting for Whitey to turn around and head back north a little bit. They'll end up flying within yeah, probably two hours of my house here nice. from where I live. So I don't really have to drive all that far to go and chase them once they get up here. But um, uh, right now we are, are we've got a, a pig hunt that is kind of right on the horizon. So we're going to go chase some wild pigs with a good buddy of ours, uh, Sam Soholt. I know mm -hmm. you'd know that name. So Sam and a, a bunch of other guys, we're going to go run down to Texas, hopefully shoot a bunch of wild pigs down there, help out my buddy who's a farmer. Um, the pigs are, are coming in, wrecking all of his crops, oh, irrigated yeah. cotton, irrigated alfalfa and uh, irrigated wheat. And they're just ripping it up and destroying all that stuff. So we're going to go down there, do a little pig control and then um, well, I guess it's kind of like a bacon run. We are gonna try and come home. We've got the, we've got the goal set at about twelve hundred pounds of meat right now. So that's what we're looking to bring home. Hopefully, we can surpass that. I think we will. But uh, uh, yeah, we're gonna do a lot of filming for one of Sam's projects, yep. and yep. Uh, should be should be a good time. A lot of no, fun. That, had. that is cool. That's cool. Yeah, Sam got. I don't, I don't, it's not it's not fair to say he got his start but one of the one of the projects that he got in on pretty early was he and our sales manager here for Eastman's went on a high country mule deer hunt in Colorado okay and Brandon's Brandon Mason's my age he's like 43 mm -hmm. and Sam was obviously quite a bit younger yep and they got this location they got an idea for this hunt um, from Aaron Snyder at Kafaru Mm -hmm. and he's like yeah go here you won't see anybody you hike up to this spot and then you got to go up this ridge yada 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 well the story goes that they spent like i don't know how many days in there and never saw a deer 
<laughs> it was like crazy. And they had this shared miserable experience. But the really funny thing that Brandon tells about is he's like, yeah, here I am, the old guy hiking up this ridge trying to, you know, I got and Sam's right on his right on his tail the whole time. <laughs> and he's like, I'm trying not to be like, oh, man, this young guy is going to come on, old man, get up that hill, you know. And a couple of days later, they start talking about it. And he's like, and Sam goes, well, dude, I had a hell of a time keeping up with you. He's like, I'm like, holy crap, man, slow down a little bit. They were both like, didn't want to show that right. it was hard. You yeah, know? right. A pretty funny story, but. Uh, <sighs> the old alpha male syndrome. That's just it. That's just it. Like, I can't show you that I'm, that I'm sucking wind driving, climbing to 14,000 feet, you know. Oh, good oh, stuff. Oh, man, but. Yeah, so I, I've never had the pleasure of meeting Sam, but that's that's a Sam Soul story that I've got that I get uh, to share, like, secondhand, you know? Awesome. So, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's cool. That is cool. But, yeah, I'm I'm kind of hoping we can get out your way this spring and, and chase some birds around, too. We uh, Last year, you know, COVID killed everything. Yeah. And we, had a, we had a snow goose hunt planned in uh, South Dakota, probably not far from where you are. We mm -hmm. were on the kind of down there on the borderland. Okay. And yeah. uh, anyway, we were getting that squared away and planned, and it just it didn't work out. And no. so it was like, okay, that's not going to happen. And then this year, trying to make that happen is like, well, now I got to take all the clients that I had from last year and put them into this year. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. So if we get to do it, we get to do it. But if not, we'll be chasing turkeys in short order and chasing. Yeah chasing predators around until that happens but mm -hmm. right on good that is cool so talk tell me more about the nodak system i we got to use it a little bit we never okay. had uh, granted we're not using it to hide from snow geese we're using it we would put that to the test out here on honkers and yeah. and ducks like just hiding in plain sight out on, on a you know when you're trying to decoy birds into a small creek or along mm -hmm. the river or Maybe laying out in the, but we don't, you know, you're, we're usually in A-frames or layouts here, mm -hmm. but I haven't, so I didn't get it. We haven't had snow, so I really mm -hmm. haven't right. had much of a chance to to wear it and check it out. I'm like, yeah, this is, I love the idea behind this series. I love the, the concept of no more throwaway whites, you know, no yeah. more disposable whites. Yeah. You've got a set of clothes that are going to work and you got a cover set that's going to last you for forever. Yeah. But yeah, they're. Uh, super comfortable and uh, non-disposable. So that's that was probably the two main things that went into the design part of the whites. And every stop along the way, like I said, we went on that tour and, de and delivered a, hand delivered a bunch of uh, sets to uh, some guides along the way. And every single time they would try them on, their first response was to enter into some type of race or piggybacking or whatever like they they and it just goes to to show how well you can move in them and uh a lot of the guys had had uh, a different brand of pvc style um of whites that kind of used to be pretty popular might be a little bit more popular on fishing boats and stuff and they're so thick and they, there's just no mobility allowed yeah. with them hardly at all and and they're clammy and they don't breathe at all and uh so most everyone has had experience with those and can't really stand them basically um you can't walk in them and can't move and so they tried the sitka whites on and they were high stepping and high kicking and <laughs> jumping around and and uh Cooper and Rylan ended up racing around uh, Kansas Hurt Locker and raced up the stairs with them, and it was it was it was pretty good. Uh, JD uh, down at Falco, he gave Aaron a piggy. They were gonna go for a piggyback ride around the uh, whatever around the, and the around the shop, but uh, um, so yeah, they're they're super comfortable, and that's kind of that's that's really what um, makes a lot of. Sitka gear so unique is just uh, uh, the attention to design and the craftsmanship that goes into it. But, um, you know, I've had a set, uh, a couple sets of prototype whites for like a year and a half now, something, and they were used when I got them. So they've been working on all aspects of the whites for a long time, over two years. And uh, that just, 
it's just so cool to to be a part or help out with a company that puts that much attention into the design of their products and they did not leave any stone unturned as far as I'm concerned uh, with the design of them because they had the snow goose hunter in uh, in in their their foresight basically and um, everything about snow goose hunting is just going to destroy clothes yeah. and destroy zippers first and foremost destroy zippers and then it's going to destroy the integrity of the clothing whatever it is uh, on top of that so um, like the bibs have awesome zippers, you know, that run from your knee all the way right up to like basically your armpits. Right. And so you're able to take both of those zippers and zip them down to your waist or whatever and take a leak out in the field. If that's what you need to do, it's there's full access there. Um, they'll zip completely off so you can put them on and off with boots on that's no big deal uh, or take them off before you jump in your truck if you got to go and leave the mud with uh, the bibs or, or whatever and then all of the the zippers well they ran the zippers down to about the knee and then from the knee down to the boot it's all snaps from there <clears throat> uh, on there so like your your calf down to your ankle is all snaps and uh, and that's just to keep those zippers out of the mud and then all of those seams have like the seam that goes right this this seam right here has a storm flap on it with yep. velcro to try and keep mud out of those zippers the seams along the side of your legs have storm flaps with velcro to keep mud out of the zippers you know there's backups on backups and that's that's really uh um them trying their best at uh protecting these things against as much mud as possible and just battling against the mud and the conditions that the snow goose guys put them through so um yeah i'm super happy with them we've we've hunted in them uh we've washed them and they came out perfect my white jacket is right back here i was I butchering what today is um thursday i was butchering pigs in that thing i um, saw that i saw that Friday. post you made on social yeah. media yeah, and i was i was looking at them because because like i said we haven't had a chance to to put them through the kind of paces that you have and i was I saw that post and I was like, well, that answers a pretty good question. You can get pig blood out of them. Yeah. It, they know? were just full of red dirt, you know, red Texas dirt and pig blood. And uh, they just came out of the wash yesterday or the day before. Yeah. It's, um, and there they are. I mean, that, yeah, they're white. this whole thing was just pure blood that right. it was pretty gnarly. So um, that's yeah. it. They're, they, came, they came clean. I got, I got heckled. Uh, I got asked a bunch of times like if they would come clean in the wash and then I washed them and then I got heckled because they said who would wash your whites well <laughs> you got, can't I mean, win can't, can't win, win. <laughs> haters gonna hate man that's just the way it's gonna be oh goodness you know, we we had uh I had a, a new guy we we hired this year in the office and uh took him on a late season elk hunt and he killed a bull and we're butchering it and getting it knocked, getting it all squared away. And of course, there's no, you know, you're you're gonna get blood on your clothes. There's just no, <laughs> there's no two ways around it. You know, you're handling a handling a ninety pound hind quarter, you know, and it's yeah. like you you're gonna get bloody. And yeah. he's like, it's, man, it's it's when you throw it on your shoulder and then you can feel it run down, running the down your back. back. <laughs> exactly. You're like, ah, oh, whatever. But it's. <laughs> I was wearing, I don't remember what I was wearing. I think I was wearing a Sitka, a Jetstream jacket. Yep. And it's a tan one. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, like you said, shoulders got blood on it. There's blood in my, and he's yep. blood on the sleeves, you know. And he looks at me, he's like, man, did, does the blood come out of that stuff? Or holy smokes, you know, because he's looking at it going, dude, that's like an expensive jacket. And you're just yep. trashing it, you know. Yeah, right. And I, was, I said, oh, yeah. I said, oh yeah, my my, I'll throw this in the laundry with maybe some OxyClean, but usually mm -hmm. just regular detergent. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, it'll 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 all come out. So a couple of days later, I wore the same jacket into work after I'd been <laughs> washed. And he's like, what? Holy smokes! There's no blood on that thing. It's not even stained. And I said, yeah. I said that's whatever Sitka does with their fabrics and their treatments, dude. I, like you said, everything is purpose built. Yeah, it's 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 thought out years in advance. Yep. I mean, they're working on. Last year, we taught when we did that hunt with Jim Sobeer. You know, he's not going to release everything he's doing, but 
he said, you know, basically this was 2020, mm -hmm. so the beginning of 2020. And he goes, basically I'm working on stuff for 2023, 2024. That's wild. Huh? You know, they're that's already crazy. that far out because the stuff that's yeah. going to release in 20, 2021 or 2020, like the whites, yep. they've been working on those for three years. Yeah. You know, yep. Two or three years. And it's like, they're not going to bring something to the market just because they want to. You know, they're no. going to they're gonna throw it at, at guys like you that are going to put it through the paces. They're going to grind on it all the time. And it's going to either be, it's either going to make the cut or it's not. Yeah. So I was, it was cool to see those whites. I went, man, there's going to be a lot of guys that are going to be like, I, ah, why would I spend that much money on whites? My, you know, commercial fishing gear works just fine. Well, as somebody who was a commercial fisherman and wore that stuff, <laughs> no, it's not just fine. And, and, and I was standing on my feet for hours at a time in that wearing it and it's, and it wasn't comfortable at all. Yep. And so you start laying and moving around and twisting and contorting in that, in that and trying to walk around it all. And no, no. But I think guys, once they get, if they get their hands on it, use it, or they see it. Yep. Like your example in your social, in your post the other day was, I'm glad you did that post because I went, that's going to answer a lot of questions. Guys are going to be like, yeah, but they're going to get muddy or mm -hmm. yeah, they're going to get blood all over them. Right. Right. And they're fabric. So they're going to soak it up. Yeah. But they come clean. Yep. Right. So, yeah, I think it's cool. I, I think it's a really neat deal. And I loved what you did with it. And I love that you were able to partner with Sitka on that and, and do that. There's definitely, yeah, thanks, man. definitely cool. Definitely. Appreciate cool. that. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you got coming out in the future? What, what can we look at for, from your call company and from you? Any ideas? Um, and you can, tell me, to get, are, you can tell me to get bent, dude. You seriously? We, <laughs> we've got, uh, yeah, we've got some irons in the fire that are going to be, that are going to be pretty cool to follow along with, I think. Cool. Um, I can tell you that, I can tell you of all of the feedback that I get, you know, uh, if you guys follow me on Instagram, um, I, I usually, my, my personal page, Corey Loeffler page is the one I'm most active on right. and posting stories and stuff like that on there. But you guys know how much I love game utilization, cooking everything that we are, uh, killing and everything that we've grown in the garden, stuff like that. So, um, I get the most comments, the most feedback and the most questions about all of that stuff and, you know, just recipes and what we're eating and how I did this and that. Uh, last night we had venison smash burgers, which man, I've had a lot of good venison in my day. Um, some very rare backstrap on the grill would be tough to beat, but those venison smash burgers, um, as my good buddy Mark in Texas would say, man, them will make your lip, them will make your tongue smack your brains out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, those things were just dynamite. So the, basically what I'm saying is a lot of people out there have this meat and I don't, you know, I don't care if it's an elk or a limit of honkers or, or a couple deer that you killed or whatever, or, or some wild pigs. A lot of people have this meat and they just don't exactly know what it is, what to do with yeah. it, how to yeah. relate it to what what's packaged in the store. Oh, I can just go buy this ground beef in the store. I know what I can do with ground beef. I, I can go buy this T-bone. I know what to do with the T-bone. But they got a hunker breast here, and we don't know how to relate it to uh, things in the store. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming out and a whole bunch of stuff in the works that's uh, – really hopefully going to help bridge that gap and provide some products for for people to um utilize more of that stuff and that's what cool. i love seeing if anytime i can inspire someone to create a dish that's that's all wild or mostly wild game whatever um that makes me feel really good just because you know i helped someone out i helped them you know be a little less um a little more self-sufficient basically uh, and live off the land or live more with the land than, than just buying stuff from a grocery store. So, yep. no, I hear you completely. We've got uh, in, in Eastman's hunting journals, not the bow hunting journal. We run a, it's called, we're in a section called bite me. Oh, and it, yeah. it's all recipes and wingmen. Mm -hmm. I always try to make sure there's something to do with wingmen in there. Okay. And yeah. so, I, I may be picking your brain and being like, hey, you want to be, you want to throw a recipe and some pictures in the yeah. magazine? Let's do it. Let's go. So, I'm yeah, not really, no, that, that kind of uh, stuff, that kind of stuff is, 
I'm the same way. That's something that I, I really highly value. I think it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, I was waiting that I was waiting on introducing medium rare duck breast to my girl with the skin on it to my mm -hmm. girls. Mm -hmm. And mm. they're all oh, dude. And they, and I mean, they, they eat anything. They're not picky, yep. but I was like, yeah, this bloody duck breast might be a little much, you know? <laughs> and I thought, okay. And we got, it was also one of those deals where we didn't, we weren't inundated with birds. Like sometimes you are. So mm -hmm. making sure you pick, you picked them was when plucked them was yeah it was easier to handle we just yeah. didn't have the huge volume of pile bur piles of birds that sometimes you get you know and yep. it's like i gotta breast these things out i don't yep. you know yep. so we did that and i taught them how to pluck them and get all that and they loved it you know yeah, they, loved, cool. they had a good time with it and boy did them kind of follow the gordon ramsay deal or scored the breast on the skin salt and pepper Yep. Don't put anything in the frying pan, but I threw that on my outdoor cooker and seared it yep. all around. And then I threw it on the Traeger to finish it. Okay. Awesome. Dude. It was <laughs> like, I took it off. I sliced it pretty thin and I sprinkled some brown sugar over the top of it. Okay. Yep. And man, they were just like, and all I did was salt and pepper it. You know, yeah. it was yep. simple. I was going to ask if were, you, if we, you we did that a, a lot. Yeah. I was going to ask if you, if you had a reduction of uh, some sort on there ira mccauley is a wizard in the kitchen as well and he's got i know a the lot name of, he's got um mo marsh ira he's got a lot of of reduction sauces uh -huh. that yeah. he um I, don't, and I wouldn't even know he's there's blueberries and yep. you yep. know i don't know plums and red wine and a whole bunch of stuff but uh all that citrus goes really well with that, that fatty pick duck just to Absolutely. all that citrus and all that acid to cut through the fat and they just pair so well together yeah so. i i completely agree i mm -hmm. completely agree so i was it was an experiment and i flopped i put them on the and we just did the breasts i picked the breasts and then fully mm -hmm. and then cut them off so the skin yeah. was on them perfect and like i said I did them the whole gordon ramsay way and yep. dude those little girls were like little carnivores, man. They just <laughs> just attacked that cutting board, and they were they were. I looked at my wife. I was like, "We're not going to have a lot of ducks left over." Uh, yep. You know, usually you've got by the end of the season, I've got a couple bags in the freezer that get turned into sausage or snack sticks mm -hmm. or something. You know, just to get yep. them used. Not this year. No, nope. they were eating them like going out of style. So, awesome. yeah, pretty cool. So that's that's definitely something that that I would love to explore further as we, you know, in, in the future, let's talk recipes. Yeah. And get you. I'm really, that. I'm really, um, not as much of a recipe guy. Sure. I'm sure. a technique. I'm a technique guy. So I really don't know what the heck I'm getting myself into when I go dive into a, I have an idea. Like oh, we should scientist. make, we should put a, make it a sandwich out of it or right, whatever. Right. It's right. Like, okay. Well, like this is sandwich or a stir fry or a uh, pot pie or whatever it is. And um, so I'm, I'm more kind of technique based. Yeah. Um, and that's, I just picked up some culinary knowledge from watching the food network a whole bunch. That was my go-to channel all the time. I'm not into drama TV, the bachelor garbage or football or sports. Um, if I'm not playing it or if I'm not doing it or learning something from it, I really don't have time for it. So, sure. um, so that's me, but, uh, yeah, this food network all the time, just cause I got a kick out of it. And that's cool. We just, we don't have any good restaurants around here. So it's like, nah, I can Make cook stuff. Yeah. Way better than yeah. what I can go and buy. So that's the route my wife and I take. And we, uh, quite the key, well, quite the team in the kitchen. We've got, my grandma coming over um tonight and uh we're gonna have pheasant pot pie is what's going in the oven so it's yeah like buddy all-time favorite pheasant dish and then yep, her hey if you guys if you guys want the recipe um this is the pheasant pot pie so it's the white meat and like the white gravy style but there's she has her snow goose pot pie recipe on the sitka gear website right now I'll check so, it out so yeah. it's all, that's on the sick of gear website, sick of gear website. It's in amongst all of the, uh, all of the white stuff, all the Nodak whites. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's basically the same thing, but you're, but the, with the 
red meat with the snow goose, you're running a brown gravy. Yep. So you're using red wine and beef stock in there. Uh, this, the, um, the pheasant pot pie or turkey pot pie, we've made it out of wild turkey as well. And that's white wine, um, the white wine and, and yeah. chicken stock. So yep. uh, different colors, different flavors, but basically same exact execution, same thing. A um, little bit of tastes a little bit different at the end, but um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a story there, but that's awesome. Yeah, my right wife on. my wife makes a pheasant pot pie that's to die for too. It's oh. probably very very similar. It's uh, love it. It's actually Babe Winkleman's wife, Chris Winkleman's <laughs> recipe. Yeah. yeah, awesome. And it's it's Good phenomenal. Deal. And she's done the same thing with uh, um with goose and with mm -hmm. duck with it that you're talking about with the just change it up so it's the same thing but it's different yeah. stuff. Yep. I hear you. So yeah. I, I will, that is cool. We'll try to get some, figure out somehow to do a link to that recipe with Sitka. That would be really, really cool. But yeah, yeah. Stuff like that, man. I mean, I've got, obviously we've got the wing beats blog in the, in the newsletter that would go out. If you get something, a wild hair that like, dude, I want to share this. This was mm -hmm. awesome. Let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. That would be super cool. Yeah, absolutely. No, oh, cool. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a major disconnect with guys. They get a goose breast or a duck breast, and they look at it and go, what do I do with this thing? Yeah. And it's, I mean, everybody's got their go-tos, but there's mm -hmm. so much stuff. I, I'm pretty fond of telling people, anything you can do with a piece of lean beef, Yeah, you can do with a goose breast. Yep. You, yeah. It's the same, pretty much the same. Basically... Uh, the the difference like you said is in all that wild game whether it's whitetail wild pigs or ducks or geese or elk um, all that stuff is free range no fences and they're foraging for themselves to keep keep their body at, a, at an optimal athletic body weight which is very limited amount of fat um, the only things that are fat and obese are stuff that we feed and keep in a pen so Cows and pigs and sheep uh, or turkeys and chickens, you know, that's, th those are the only things that are obese out there. So, and that's what's in the grocery store and it's all, you know, commercialized process. So that's, they do it for a reason. Um, when you add in, like say the marbling of fat into a beef steak, that it's going to add some flavor. And, but basically that fat inside of the meat is going to really just make it a lot easier to cook. You're not going to have to nail your temperatures perfect because you could cook it a little on the rare side and it's still going to be good. You could cook it a little on the well done side and it's still going to be good. You take a venison backstrap steak and cook that thing well done. Uh, there's no fat in there at all. It's no. you, you wrecked it. Sorry. I mean, it's going to turn to, to sawdust in your mouth. Those things need to be served rare if you'll eat them rare or uh, medium rare pretty much at most medium medium for sure at most um yep. if you want to enjoy eating it but uh that's that's kind of the biggest difference that i see with all the wild game is just the absence of fat so we use a lot of uh snow goose fat in our house when we can get it my favorite place to collect snow goose fat is up in uh in Saskatchewan, I go hunting with my friends up there, Northern Skies Outfitters in the in the springtime. Sure. When the geese are on their north like right now, you know, when they're on their their northern migration, uh run up there in early May, which is super late. Everyone's kinda around these parts. Everyone's getting their walleye fishing gear out and ready right. to hit the lake. And I'm I still got my twelve gauge and I'm <clears> looking <throat> across the border and and head to Saskatchewan to go chase white birds. Uh but uh those birds are so cool. The if you guys don't know about snow geese, they're reserve nesters. So they go and then nest up north of the boreal forest, up in the Arctic, and there's really nothing to eat up there for a long time. And they have to be up there, lay eggs, sit on the eggs, and just hang out with nothing to eat. So they eat as much as they possibly can when they're in the grain, the the very furthest north grain fields in Saskatchewan they chow down and absolutely put the feed bags on. So that's about the only wild animal that I've ever seen that is completely, utterly obese. And uh, they are, there's, there's fat in every square inch of those birds. So, um, which makes them very vulnerable as well, because they're looking to put the feed bags on so sure. hard that they'll sure. come bombing into decoys and, and they're just looking to eat as much as they can, 
uh, chow down on. So, um, so yeah, we'll go hunt them up there and you can't, I have not plucked one of those birds with any success ever. The, the skin, <laughs> the fat is so thick. This it's like, it's like a, uh, it's like a freaking dang balloon that you blow it up to oh. twice its size. You know, like the skin's so thin, you go to try and pluck them, and it rips everywhere. So yeah, um, we're pretty much just trying to get the breast out of there with as much fat as we can, and then the main the main two pockets of fat would be stored like in the, the, uh, the pelvic cavity, yep. uh, the pelvic area, like on either side of the large intestine as it just before it exits the body, but right in on both sides of there, uh, there's just two big, huge globs of fat. And I'll pull both of those out of there. As long as the bird's not shot, you know, in, sure. in the lower yeah. part, and you yep. start ripping BBs through the lower GI tract, and uh, yeah, you, know, you get some, pretty funky, pretty yeah, funky pretty smell. Nasty. So uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of look at the color, and if you're looking with you know real nice bright white colors, then uh, I I pull that fat out of there. I put it in a, a bag or a couple bags or whatever, and then I'll just put it with some water on the stove on a super low heat, and it's going to turn all that fat into liquid, and it's not going to burn it and cook it. So you're not looking sure. to cook the fat. Uh, to render it out. You're just looking to turn it to liquid. And then I run it through a strainer. Um, there's some little blood vessels and a little bit of connective tissue running through some of that stuff. So you're just looking to separate the liquid fat from that stuff. And I pour it all like into a coffee can. And I've came across, came home with a whole coffee can full of just pure white snow goose fat. And wow. the flash point of that fat is so high that if you want to get to frying, like like I've been talking venison backstrap, um, and put just an awesome sear on that backstrap or uh, frying fish in some of that stuff, the sear the the flash point's so high before that fat's gonna burn that you can do whatever you want with it. The flavor is amazing. Um, it's uh, I just oh man, I, I miss it. Cool. The the border being closed really. <laughs> Hits me right here. I can't get my coffee stomach. can of fat. This <laughs> <I know>. sucks. <laughs> Pretty mad about it. <laughs> Pretty passionate about that. Yeah, snow goose I can fat. tell, man. Yeah. You're, you're literally, your eyes just light <laughs> up talking about that snow goose fat. I love it. Uh, I love it. Because I'm having withdrawals. I ran out a while ago. So oh, that's that tearing me up. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> no, that's and, and you're you're honestly one of the only people I've ever talked to that utilizes the the fat out of birds like that. That's super oh, so that's good, super interesting. I mean, yeah. a lot of guys will utilize try to utilize fat out of other other things, but duck fat, duck waterfall mm. fat, duck fat, goose fat. It is man, it's it it doesn't get utilized to the point that it should. No, that's and for it, sure. I, I, if you were to, you mentioned Gordon Ramsay a little bit ago. If you were to go and talk to Gordon Ramsay and tell him that you threw duck fat away, he'd slap you. He'd slap you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you what? <laughs> what, what an, I, I, I'd have to listen to him to try. Yeah, to exactly. <laughs> Stupid yank. You bloody. Yeah. <laughs> bloody duck fat. <laughs> oh, that's. But it's 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 so true. You know, it's so true and. It's interesting to me to see how it's this is a thing, not just duck fat, but the the movement to consume everything that mm -hmm. I mean use utilize every part of the animal that you possibly can is I mean, Hunter, we've been eating what we've killed forever. Yeah. But oh, there's yeah. it's gone a step further than that, even. Nobody would have thought to harvest like do what you just talked about doing back in the day. I mean, mm -hmm. no nobody. But I won't say nobody because there's always that person. Oh, I've been doing that since I was 10, you know, and it's right. like, okay, good for you. But yeah. for the most part, it hasn't become something that we've focused on and talked about in hunting um, until just pretty recently. And it's interesting for me because we're only we're only three hours from Bozeman mm -hmm. and Bozeman kind of has that reputation of being Bozeman, you know, yeah. and it's there's a reason we call we jokingly call it Bose Angeles but <laughs> right you know it's it's Bozeman and it's not it is what it is we can laugh about that and and, and everybody can tease each other or whatever but it's interesting to me to see that movement is it's not just there it's it's mm -hmm. everywhere and it's becoming yeah. more and more popular and I like it 
I personally think, you know, I may not be digging through snow goose body cavities to do that personally, probably because mm -hmm. I don't have any snow goose cavities to do that with, but you right. know, whatever. But you gave me some ideas. You gave me, and you make me think, could I do that with these late season hawkers that we've got that have Absolutely. literally been here since yeah. October? Yeah. We've had the same stinking geese since October. Yeah. And they've been eating the same out of the same barley field, you know, and it's like, they're eating nothing but grain since since then, and they're just yep. packing on the pounds. And you watch them fly into the field, and they got to lay down and rest when they get there because they're tired from a half mile flight. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm joking, obviously, but they do. They're lazy, and you know they're getting fat mm -hmm. because they've got to do. You know, they've got to go further up, further north than this to nest. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. retain some birds, but not not like you do in the Midwest where you guys are. Yeah. And so it's, I'm thinking, I might give that a whirl. So you never know when you talk about stuff like that, who's listening and what, what you're going to inspire mm -hmm. someone to try. Yeah. Like, I really? I could fry my, my venison back straps in, in goose fat? Hmm. Oof. Oh, I, bet Dang, that's good. I bet it's delicious. I yeah, bet it's absolutely 100% delicious. We have uh, <laughs> another thing that uh, might make you go, ooh, uh, we – Fried some snow goose eggs one uh -huh. year, pulled them right out of the body cavity. They were, I ate probably about 15 snow goose eggs in one bite because they were all about little tiny things that big. We just said, We're going to try them. So they were like egg flavored gushers. So you sure. Know, you know, the candy gushers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's like a that. visual right <laughs> there. <laughs> Woo. Uh, Snow goose fat and eggs. Um, yeah. Snow goose eggs. So, you know, that's, but, that's funny because I remember when, when the snow goose population kind of became mission critical back mm -hmm. in the 90s. And it's like, yeah. dude, we got to do something or these birds are literally going to destroy their, the tundra. Yeah. Absolutely. And yep. it was like, wow, you know, what are we going to do? And that was when, that was when the, the conservation order came out and mm -hmm. these, these conservation seasons took place. Well, now they're commonplace. It's like everybody like, yeah, it's yeah, just what you do. Yeah. Back right. then it was like, you started and you started seeing guys pack, you know, killing 150, 200 birds in a day. And yeah. guys are like kind of uncomfortable with that. You know, it was yeah. like, well, geez, how many of these things do you need to kill? And it's like, right. we're not making a dent. No, not making a dent. Not a bit. It's crazy. <laughs> but I think a lot of those birds probably in it, you know, the stories were all oh, they, what do you do with them? Oh, they go to the dog food factory or they go to here, there, they end up in, I think a lot of those birds probably ended up in landfills. And so mm -hmm. to see, to see people thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. We got to be able to utilize these things. How do we do this? Yeah. I think it's awesome. Yeah. First, personally, I, I think it's really cool and I applaud you for it. Yeah. Thank and you. And I would, like I said, I would love to see a blog or two show up on the web on the wingman website and in our new yeah. and, and in the wing beats newsletter because i think it's just going to get more and more popular and i think the longer everything goes on we we do have to prove to people that begin to question well why do you need to hunt yeah why do absolutely. you need to hunt well this yeah. is there's more reasons than just food obviously and we get that but i don't think it's, the general public really it's, gets it's, that it's certainly more humane to buy your food from a grocery store that's been bludgeoned to death by someone else. Why do you need to right? Do that? Exactly. Uh, I, you know, like I said, we get that, but I don't think I think I think there's a big disconnect with yep. with people and food. Yep. It's like they just see the well. <laughs> here's an example. I've got a a Facebook post that we put together that's like I don't know three million views, two and a half million views, and it's it's just a, like a it's just a kill shot compilation. Mm -hmm. It was like, let's just put this together quick. People want to see it, so we'll put it out there. And it's got lots of views, but it got served somewhere overseas. Oh, I have to have all these. I have all these. I don't know Middle Eastern. I don't know what. I don't sure. know how you'd say it politically. Lots of lines and yeah, yep, yep. And it's all hate. Yeah, it is all hate. Like yep. I can't believe you should be you should be stoned to death for killing these birds, and it's all hate. And then Does that makes sense. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I don't get it. I don't understand it. But it is it was interesting to see, and I I think that 
that disconnect becomes so big mm -hmm. that we just don't, we don't even think about it. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, let me go to McDonald's and eat some food that, you know, yep. didn't have to suffer. Yep. Okay. I can hear your lettuce screaming from here, but <laughs> <laughs> rabbits need to eat too. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But rabbit and all these rabbit hater salad lovers out there. I know it. I know it. Right? Shamed. Mm -hmm. I know it. Well, dude, I've got to, I'm going to close with a question that I've tried, been trying when I remember to ask everybody. I had Alex Langbell on the other day and I forgot to ask him at the end of this, end <laughs> of this episode, but if you could only hunt one bird one way for the rest of your life, what's it going to be? I just love those big honkers in the field, in the dry field. I can't get enough of that stuff. That's I was born and raised. I cut my teeth doing that. Um, that's it, you know. Uh, there's better things to eat out there for sure that, that I, I have fallen in love with in recent times, like uh, a good late season plucked mallard or uh, a spring snow goose. But, man, communicating with those with those big honkers that the language that they have um you know that's how i make my living selling selling these goose calls so that's right uh, <laughs> i gotta pump that a little bit but uh no i i i fell in love with that at, at a super early age probably oh, 14 or 15 running around with one of those same big flute calls that you had talked about and uh ah, just can't get enough of it um every time i go out there and and uh, have a, a conversation with one it just it, it just brings me right back and just like a little kid in a candy store so that's it that's my that's my final answer that's cool i love it i love it i'm right there with you i i in fact it's gotten to the point where even in the big game line of things if i can't communicate with an animal with calls i'm not all that hot to do it yeah uh, the, the archery elk game is oh it's so much fun and not just archery. You get some, some, you, they'll, they'll even work with you with calls sometimes later in the year too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that communication aspect and, and nothing does it quite like, I mean, yeah. turkeys are pretty special too, but. Oh, they're fun. They're, yeah, they're big them. gobblers are, are a blast, but man, yeah. there's something about honkers. I'm, yep. I'm with you. Yep. I'm with you. I've been a goose hunter since I was a kid. Yep. That's cool. Well, Corey, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. This Heck has yeah. been an awesome conversation, man. And uh, I'm going to stop recording and we'll wrap it up. All right. Thanks a lot, Todd, and all you wingmen out there, wingmen and women. <laughs> Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Take care.